So here's a calibration uh, a, a shot, a string shot. Here is a large event, probably one of those 1,000 to 2,000 nanometer per second events up there to minus one. And here's what our typical data looks like when the ground motion is more like 100 nanometers per second. It's down there at the level of the noise. We do a move out, so the process is we have a velocity model, we calculate through ray tracing what the move out correction would be. It's, think of this as a Kirchhoff migration type approach, but in depth, we're calculating the, the travel times from a depth model. And we apply the move out correction, and now you can see these events are lining up. This is, in fact, a judgment. Here comes the pizza. This is, in fact, a judgment of just how good your velocity model is. And if you're really good and you've got a lot of experience, and if you're old like me at this point, you would stand over on the side and you'd start to look along and say, oh, yeah, I can start to trace that event that's in there. And then, of course, if you stack it, now we get really strong signal to noise, probably 100 to 1 for the string shot, down there in the 30 or 40 to 1 for the actual two events that we're sticking here. And even this signal that we could not see after stack is getting up there in the 10 to 1 range. That's how this process from the surface works. It's as simple as that. The downside of the surface array approach where around the well bore we lay the geophones in what we call a frac star, where we build this dish antenna on the surface of the earth, a dish antenna whose diameter is about twice the depth. So in the Marcellus, these dish antenna are about 14, 15,000 feet, two, two and a half miles across. The disadvantage of that is that it takes a lot of kit laid out on the surface. It's expensive. It's not too bad if you're doing a multiple well pad like I showed you that movie, but it probably costs three or four hundred thousand dollars to lay out this equipment, record data for two weeks and pick it up again. So as operators have moved to wanting to monitor a larger and larger percentage of their wells, as they've begun to recognize the value proposition inherent in microseismic monitoring, They've wanted to reduce the cost of doing that. And the way to do it that we've suggested is that you put in a buried array, a permanent life of field facility, where you bury the phones in below the surface of the ground so that you can have fewer stations, and you leave it there cemented in, and every time you monitor, you want to monitor another well, you either run out and attach the recording devices, or in fact, if you're really aggressive, put radio transmitters in at each site and bring the data back. So this is, this is kind of the procedure. This is us installing one of these buried arrays. We'll typically put a bit of a vertical antenna in there. There'll be multiple levels. And down about 300 feet, uh, we judge that by how fast the noise is falling off. I have two of these in the Marcellus. And in the Marcellus, since the overburden is so thin, we only have to put these down about 100 feet below the surface to get a 20 dB reduction in noise, which is what we aim for. Oh, it's just, an, well, this is in fact the, uh, an illustration of the, the test that we do first, where we put in, again, the string of phones, and we measure the fall off of noise with depth. This was the phone at the surface, and then down, uh, I guess, a, that was 100. Yeah, that was 120 feet, then that's 220 feet, 320 feet, and you notice it doesn't really fall off anymore when you get down 520 feet. Have a good lecture. Yes, thank you. So we, in this case, we elected to put the phones down at about 320 feet. And this is what the installation looks like at the end of the day. This is up in North Dakota. It's a field that, it's, it's an installation and a buried array that covers 150 square miles. It's got 300 some odd stations in it. Each one of them has a radio antenna and a seismic recording device and all of the data are, are transmitted in real time back to a central location where they are recorded and processed. We lit this up a year ago, March, March 1 a year ago in North Dakota. Since that time, we've been recording on this array for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We've recorded more than 100 wells being fracked, more than 2,000 fracked jobs. 
probably about 2,500 frac jobs. This approach, I said, is kind of the new approach to uh, doing the monitoring because it allows the operators to move in the direction of recording many more of their wells cost effectively. I should say that the average cost to whiting for the, f for the monitoring of those 2,500 fracks uh, over the last year, the average cost has been $2,000 a frac stage. They're paying $200,000 a frac stage to pump those wells. It's so cheap they can't afford not to monitor the wells and that's just the way it is. So down in the Haynesville, uh, since we started putting these arrays in in 2000, late 2008, we've now got 15 or so of those arrays in. This is Texas over here. Uh, and this is Louisiana over here. I can't even read the, the names. I think this is Shreveport. This is the Sabine River coming down between Texas and Louisiana. And you can see the arrays that we've got in there. They're now starting to butt up against each other and meld together. And really within three years, we expect to have that entire play underneath uh, one single large array recording every frack that's done. Uh, okay, I think maybe in the interest of time I might skip through this part really fast because this is just a repetition of what I showed you in terms of the move out. But to reiterate, we have an array on the surface, we collect the data from a signal. We then actually have to scan the cube in the subsurface looking for where all the possible events might have occurred. And this just represents what we're doing. Think of it as Kirchhoff migration, where we're in fact just stacking up all the possible places that that signal could have come from. And where the stack amplitude is the highest is, is the most likely location of the event, with all the caveats about errors in the velocity model and noise, and the width of the wavelet causing us some spreading of the event. Now, if we put one of our little hypocenters, which is what we do, at each one of those amplitude peaks, we end up with something that looks like this. This is actually synthetic data. And I, I like to think of this as the DNA of the events. Only real signals will produce this kind of predictable distribution of amplitudes within the data volume and it's by looking for that predictable distribution that we separate signal from noise in our data set. This is what a real event looks like in our data cube where we've put a dot, if you like, one of these hypocenter estimates at every one of the amplitude peaks that was created by that search process previously. And as I said, the width of the the width of the data set, the bandwidth of our data that's above a certain level of signal to noise is what really controls our resolution. Resolution in the vertical direction is going to be less than it is in the horizontal. Good signal to noise will give us 10 foot resolution in the horizontal. The resolution in the vertical or the uncertainty in the vertical, I should say, is probably two to three X that for the same signal to noise level. And that's just from the geometry of our migration problem. To give you some sense of uncertainty, I have a couple of diagrams here that illustrate the geometric, only the geometric uncertainty for a, a typical noise level and a typical bandwidth, comparing the uncertainty between estimating these hypocenters from a surface array and from a downhole array. And I thought you might find this interesting from us. We're looking in map view now. In the, from the surface, you don't see any change in the uncertainty as long as you're within the sweet spot of your antenna. And as I mentioned, the horizontal is the best resolved direction that we have with surface arrays. So here you see that for this typical event at 10,000 feet, for given noise situation, the Horizontal uncertainty in both the radial direction, if we, if we think of the radial as being the distance from the hypothetical monitor well or the treatment well, in the radial and the transverse direction are equal, and they're on the order of 10 or 20 feet, depending on which dB down you choose that point on the uncertainty curve. 
From a downhole array, the downhole array is over here at zero. It goes into the earth at zero. And what you're looking at here is distance, range, in the radial direction away from the monitor well to the event that you are resolving. I mentioned earlier that as, the, as you get away, the effective aperture becomes smaller and geometrically that causes you a larger uncertainty. So you can see that at, at about a distance equal to the aperture, you have this, uh, you have an, an error in the horizontal that's about equivalent to the surface array. As you move farther away, particularly the transverse uncertainty, that is the uncertainty in the horizontal direction this way and that, left and right, gets very large. If you look at the vertical, this is from the surface array now, and as I mentioned, the vertical uncertainty from a surface array is about three times what it is in the horizontal at a given signal to noise. If you look at, again, the distance away from the monitor well, you can see how that vertical error is actually only at the closest point to the monitor well is it equivalent to the error from a surface array. So the vertical is really good, or sorry, the downhole monitoring is really good to get signal size, magnitude, particularly if you're in a new area, but has limitations for how far away you can see, and particularly these days when people are drilling ever longer horizontal wells, it's really difficult to monitor the whole length of that horizontal well with the downhole technique. That's why the surface technique is catching on so much. All right, I want to finish with just some thoughts about going beyond what we call the dots in the box, or the dots. Up till now, everything I've talked about is signal to noise, trying to capture the location of these hypocenters, both in time and space, the uncertainty that's associated with the different techniques and how that uncertainty is driven by both the geometry of our problem and by some of the uh, signal to noise issues that we have. Now I want to talk about once we've got that far, what more we can do with these data. And that's really the exciting part of what's going on in my industry right now. It's trying to squeeze more knowledge out of these hypocenter estimates. So it's no surprise to you here that all of these events are, in fact, little earthquakes, right? We don't typically say that out in the public. People get concerned about buildings falling down. But I am using earthquake locating technology to do this, and each one of these hypocenters is in fact a small break, a fracture, a movement in the earth. It is a small earthquake, albeit awfully small. So being an earthquake, it has some sense of failure, just as the, uh, the um, Haitian earthquake was strike-slip and the Chilean earthquake and the Japanese earthquakes were dip-slip. There is some sense of motion on that failure plane, and that sense of motion can A, be detected on the larger events, and B, is diagnostic of the stress regime at the point of failure. We know that in, in uh, stress regimes where the dominant stress is vertical, probably the sedimentary load, as, and then we have the horizontal stresses that we're typically going to get normal faulting. We'll get normal faulting when the stress differences between the two horizontal stresses are low, that is, it's relatively low stress anisotropy. We know that if the dominant stress is in the horizontal, but the next dominant is in the vertical, or in other words, we have large stress anisotropy, we're more likely to get some sort of strike-slip type failure and larger events. So if we can start to get at some of the sense of failure on these planes, on these hypocenters, on these microseismic events, we can start to move towards this kind of analysis in what's going on in the oil field. Well, with a downhole array, you only sample a very small part of the focal sphere, the wave front from the event. It's difficult to get an unambiguous estimate of what's going on in terms of the failure mechanism. But with a large aerial array over the surface, to the extent that we do see the arrivals, we actually can see very well the polarity distribution of first arrivals and then make a determination of the mechanism.